Yes, it's uh, always uh, a blessing. I say it is always a blessing to gather and uh, to look into the word of God. And I pray that uh, this week uh, it will be a blessing to all of us. I want to welcome us to this uh, camp and to this week in uh, learning and sharing of uh, the word of God, because uh, the word of God is uh, meat indeed. And uh, we want to take uh, every opportunity to enjoy the privileges that uh, we have while uh, we still have peace. And so, as we near the close of the time, there's some things we have to get right. And uh, we are told that the topic of righteousness by faith, this topic of justification, is good news to us. And so I want us to look at uh, this presentation. Number one in our camp, justification. Uh, the good news. What we are going to look at, the topic I have uh, named it justification. the good news. And so i like us to pray and then uh, we continue sharing in the word of God, justification, the good news. And uh, in the topic of righteousness by faith, it is encompasses the whole issue of uh, how to deal with sin, why sin was permitted and what was the plan to be able to address the issue of sin. And so I'd like us to pray as uh, we start uh, the session. We pray our loving Father in heaven, thank you so much for you have given us grace once again to study your word. And we pray that uh, we may be blessed Lord, we may draw closer to thee, that at the end of the day, we may reflect the image of thy son and that the people may praise thee. Help us, Lord, as this week we go through these sessions and when we come at the end of it, Lord, we may be like Moses who met thee in the mountain, our face shining with a new light. And Lord, that he may impact our neighbors, our colleagues, our workmates in a positive way. And so give us a good heart that will be a soil to receive your word and uh, walk in it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If uh, there is uh, a topic that has ever concerned the whole Christendom is the topic of sin and it is solution. And uh, that is why I say that the, the issue of uh, justification is good news because justification actually reverses what happens in uh, Genesis chapter three. Justification reverses in what happens in Genesis chapter three. And uh, there's no other good place to start such a presentation than uh, in the book of Genesis itself where the problem arose. And so I, I like us to get involved, I like us to see how the story unfolds and how if God allowing the story ends, we shall be able to see it. And so the best place to start is in the book of Genesis itself, Genesis chapter three. 
we go to the book of uh, Genesis chapter three and uh, The good news. Look at Genesis chapter three, from verse one. It's talking about uh, the fall of man, but uh, in Genesis chapter three, verse fifteen. Uh, Genesis chapter three, verse fifteen. We find the first prophecy, and this first prophecy, what encompasses it is the plan of redemption. And there is where justification is found. After Adam being asked where he was in verse 9, immediately man sinned, he ran away from God. And God didn't wait for man to do anything good. That is the good news about justification. God does not wait for us to do anything good. Before man could do anything and was uh, really blaming God, because when Adam was asked, how is it thou that thou have hidden yourself? And how is it that thou entered into sin? You didn't listen to my word. Adam straight away says that uh, uh, this woman that you gave me, verse 12, and the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to me, to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. And then God does not actually go into many stories. Before he goes to any other stories, he asks the woman, what is it? Why have you done what you have done in verse 13? And then the woman says that uh, the serpent beguiled me. Now you notice before God tells man about the suffer that will follow. You see that in 15, there is a promise. Are you seeing how God is addressing the issue of sin? Because the consequences of what will befall them starts in verse uh, in verse uh, in verse 16, is it? Look at verse 15. After asking them about what had happened. In verse 15, he says, and I'll put an enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Already a seed is promised before anything else. And then he goes ahead to speak to the woman that I'll greatly multiply your sorrow and to the man because thou hast hearkened to thy wife's voice. There is a, uh, Plan of redemption, there is hope before everything else is laid bare in the promise of the seed. And the seed we understand according to Galatians, uh, Galatians 3.16. Galatians 3.16. It says, Are we in Galatians 3.16? The good news about justification. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith, and to seeds, and he saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So Christ is the seed. So when you go back to Genesis 3, verse 15, and I'll put an enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. So while actually Satan is attacking humanity, he's attacking the seed himself, which is Jesus Christ. And so this is the enmity that has been created. And we are told that when we are in Christ, then the war is not ours, but the war is of the Lord. And so 
when you look uh, in the book of Job, thirty-one, thirty-three. Job thirty-one, thirty-three. It says that if I covered my transgressions as Adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom. Job thirty-one, thirty-three. So. Adam in Genesis, he actually hid his iniquity. He could not confess it, but he started them games. But God, God cannot argue with man. God cannot argue with man. What he does, he promises him that there is a seed. And in this seed, that is where your strength lies. Because in this seed, you shall bruise the head of the serpent and the serpent shall bruise the hill. So we know that in this promise of Genesis 3.15, God was promising Adam and Eve strength enough to be able to destroy the serpent. We are talking about justification, the good news. Before we could do anything else, Christ promises strength unto us. Let us open the book of uh, Psalms, the division of Psalms 32. But we, before, before we go to Psalms 32, we are going there. In uh, Romans chapter five, verse six, we are told, for when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. When you are, Yet without what? In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. This is what it justification encompasses. This is what is contained in the plan of redemption, strength to be able to overcome the enemy. Strength to be able to overcome the enemy. And uh, Paul, Paul, Paul says that, um, is it in Corinthians, first Corinthians, that uh, my strength it should be in second corinthians sorry made perfect in No, Second Corinthians twelve nine. Yeah. Are we there? Can we read it? Yes. So the power is in Christ. In justification, in this plan of redemption, the power is in who? In Christ. We ourselves, in reality, we are weak. But now our strength is made, uh, the strength of Christ is made perfect in our weakness. His grace is sufficient. And so in the first prophecy, in the first line, in the promise of the plan of redemption, in the giving of the seed, what is being given is strength and grace to be able to fight all infirmities. And when you look at this grace in Titus chapter two, verses 11, I'll be giving out these verses so that we may ponder about them, the good news about justification. Titus chapter two, verses 11 to 15. If you are there, please. Yes. Yes. 
Yeah, for the grace has appeared, and this grace is a lesson unto us. The grace of God is a lesson unto us, for it teaches us to deny ungodliness. It doesn't only teach, but actually it gives us the blessed hope of the appearing of the uh, the glorious appearing of uh, a great God our great God and our savior, Jesus Christ. And so what I want you to understand that when we speak about uh, the giving of the seed, who is Jesus Christ, in that promise is the strength to overcome sin. Satan made us weak by falling into sin, but Christ cancels it. God gives us his son to be able to overcome sin. Look at Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3 from verse 5. You can start as early as 3. Titus 3, 3 to 7. We and status, living in marriage and empty, hateful and hating one. Verse 4. But after the birth, the kindness and love of God and Savior toward man, not of words of righteousness, which was done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of his generation and the renewing. Which he shed on abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by what? His grace, his strength. We are justified by his strength, his grace. Because we have just found out that grace is his strength. We should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That is the good news about justification. We are made strong by his grace. His grace is his strength. And so look at now at Psalms 32. We are to go to the division of Psalms 32. That divine favor, in the larger context, grace, actual grace is unmerited favor, is it? Yes. Coming with what? Divine power. Yeah. If you look at it, uh, because you asked that, is grace something else? Is it, is it only unmerited favor? No, but grace itself is also strength because it teaches us to deny ungodliness. It is not just a lesson book but actually it comes with that power because we have been bestowed. Uh, that is why we are told that it's not by our works, but his grace. And so the unmerited favor, it comes with that divine strength. That is why we say that, uh, and we, we, when we read the Bible, we understand that justification is not only a legal term that your sins have been forgiven but also it's an experiential uh, process. It is something that we experience. Um, because you asked that question, I'll, uh, I'll just refer to something here in uh, Steps to Christ before we go to Psalms 32. Steps to Christ 52. fifty-two point two. Steps to Christ 52.2. About grace. SC 52.2 is is uh, is grace only unmerited favor or it is something else what does it come with steps to Christ 52.2 SC 52.2 it says some feel some seem to feel that they must be on probation and must prove to the Lord that they are reformed because they can claim his blessings but they may claim the blessing of God even now they must have his grace, the spirit of Christ. You see that? They must have what? His grace, the spirit of who? Of Christ to help their infirmities. When you are weak, what do you need? 
you need strength and second corinthians have told us in your weakness my strength is made perfect so grace represents here unmerited favor it represents the power of the holy spirit working in a believer so as they may be able to resist evil and if they do not have this grace they may they cannot resist evil jesus loves to have us come to him just as we are sinful helpless dependent we may come with all our weakness our folly our sinfulness and fall at his feet in penitence it is his glory to encircle us in the arms of his love and to bind up our wounds to cleanse us from every impurity so the grace of god the unmerited favor the strength to overcome sin comes from jesus christ himself we will we were to go to psalms the division of psalms 32 psalms 32 and i want somebody to be there to read uh from verses one the good news about justification these are important verses while you are reading actually the issue of justification. This is a Psalm of David. If you are there, you can start from verse one. Yes, continue. When I get silent, my bones want to all, in my body all the day. For day and night, thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the dust of the earth. I acknowledge my sin unto thee and my iniquity have I not hid. I say, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgivest the iniquity of my sin. Go to us, uh, seven. Pray. Thou art my serving flesh, thou shalt serve me forever. Thou shalt consult me about the sons of the Yes, and so David says that blessed is the man and whom the Lord imputeth not what? Iniquity. Are you seeing that? Yeah, that the work of the Lord. You remember the story of Adam and Eve, is it? When the Lord came to ask them where they were, did he impute on them sin? There was the promise first, is it? Yeah. So blessed is the man whom the Lord imputed not iniquity and in whose spirit there is no guide. So what he does, he forgives us. And then what does he do? Gives us that power so that in our mouth there is no guide. In Adam's mouth, there was guile. He hid from confessing his iniquity. And so that is why we are told uh, on the same note, the Lord not imputing iniquity. Look at, at uh, Second Corinthians. Justifications, the good justification, the good new, news. Five, chapter five. Oh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, this is verse um, 19. It says, To it that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of what? Reconciliation. So in Psalms, we are told that blessed is a man whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. And in 2 Corinthians 5.19, we are told that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself and not imputing their trespasses unto them. The blessed news about justification, that God through Christ 
In fact, Christ is the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of what? Of the world. Immediately there was sin, there was who? A savior. God himself provided for a lamb in the book of Genesis. He provided for a lamb and then the lamb and it is so it's so wonderful that when the lamb was slain, the skin was used for what? For clothing Adam and Eve, is it? Yeah. Now we understand the lamb is Jesus Christ. Is it? And the clothing is the clothing of his righteousness. He is the one who dies for us and he's the one who clothes us with that righteousness because the garments represents the garments of salvation. Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. Is it 61 verse 10? And 11. Isaiah 61 10 and 11. Talking about the lamb and the skin making the garments. Look at these wonderful thoughts in Isaiah 61, 10, and 11. Yes. Yes, was 11. So Adam was not cast away from the Garden of Eden for a reproach, but actually the righteousness of God may be able to spread all over the world. And so through Christ, God starts working with Adam and Eve for the restoration of the image of God that had been lost. And so we see this good news that uh, actually Adam and Eve partake of, having the lamb provided for them and the clothing. For our clothing, the clothing that they were having, actually, were they good? What did they do after sinning? They made clothes out of leaves. How enduring are leaves? How long can you live with dressed with leaves? A moment. A moment, is it? And when the sun is too hot, they will dry out. Yeah, is it? Yeah. And then they'll fall off. Yes. That is Isaiah 60. Thank you so much, brother. Six. Yes, go ahead and read it. Mm -hmm. You see the leaves fade away. Is it? And the wind does what? Takes them away. So what man could see was best for him, actually in the eyes of God, it was nothing. And so he had to clothe them with something that is enduring, the skin of the lamb. And that is how justification becomes good news unto us. And so I pray that these messages actually will uh, even make us fall in love with Jesus Christ more than ever before. Christ, our righteousness is some sublime message. It is a balm, it is a water in the desert for a traveler. And we see that uh, the law of God demanded righteousness, which man could not offer. The law demanded righteousness, which man could not offer. And only death and terror faced the first pairs in the Garden of Eden. But no, 
God provides a solution. And when we look at Jesus Christ, in John 16, 33, he says something. John 16, 33. In this world, you will have what? John 16, 33. Yes, be of good cheer. Satan has come with all his force. But Christ is saying, be of good cheer because not because you have overcome the world. Who has overcome? Christ has overcome. And that doesn't mean that we can overcome. If Christ has overcome and he has adopted us as his children, who are we? Overcome us, is it? Yeah. If Christ has overcome and he says that you are my child, then it means in him. When we are in him, we are assured of victory. That is why the message of justification by faith is a sublime and a precious topic. Why? Because it reminds us, though we fail into sin or we have fallen into sin, we can overcome and re regain our lost estate. Be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. Look at uh, John chapter 14, verse 27. These are familiar texts that we read of encouragement, and we don't see how they play about in the issue of justification. 27. Peace I live with you. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. He says that he gives us peace. And so this peace can only be received by receiving him. You remember Jesus Christ when he is in the boat and there are storms and then he is just resting peacefully, is it? Why is he resting peacefully? And the disciples are concerned that the ship is going to sink or the boat. And then he arises from his sleep. When they go to wake him up, he arises and tells the storm, be still which means that in Christ, we are assured of this victory. And he promised in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come unto me, ye who are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Rest from what? Rest from sin, because it is sin which has made a heavy load on our lives. And Christ is promising us victory over this. And so when we look at our filthiness and we look at the righteousness of Jesus Christ, actually, sometimes we see a big gap, but Christ doesn't want us to do something so grievous for us to have that righteousness. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18. Let me confirm, 2 Corinthians 3.18 as we behold him. Is it 2 Corinthians 3, 18, is it? Yes. Yes. Yes, as we behold him, we are changed from glory to glory. Why? Because he is an overcomer and he promised in Genesis 3.15 that he will bring this enmity between evil and good. And good will triumph over every evil. 
And so we see this text speaking to us, bringing us the good news that no one else can offer. The best offer we can receive is the offer from Christ. The offer of being victorious. The offer of giving us his spirit so that we may be able to contend with all the powers of their evil. Thus, the word declares that God is the source of righteousness and that it is one of his divine attributes. The supreme question regarding righteousness of God, the question of deepest interest and consequence to us is our personal relation to that righteousness. How do we relate with this righteousness? After Adam fell into sin, after the promise, now how do we relate into this righteousness? It is not something grievous that we do but accepting him. When we accept him, we partake of this righteousness. If we have to develop anything good in us, then it means that the spirit must be working in us. You look at this analogy. I say we shall read very simple verses. Look at John 15. If we have to have any righteousness, then it comes from Jesus Christ because our own righteousness is filthy rags. John chapter 15. This is a subject that eludes us most of the time, but it shouldn't be eluding us. John 15, verse one, yes, Ray. No, no, 15, you are in uh, chapter five, 15, chapter 15. Yes. Yes. Number three. Abide in me and I in you as the branch. Yes, so we are the branches and he is the vine, is it? Mm -hmm. But you notice the father is the husband man. And so the whole thing falls from the father to the son to us and in title goes back the same. He has planted us. He is our righteousness. Christ our righteousness. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the vine. The father is the husband. Man. We are the branches. What is the difference? What is the work of the husband? Man? The source of everything. The owner of everything, is it? Yeah. The flowing through the sun. To the branch. From the branch to the sun. In fact, yes. So the righteousness, you know, God created man in his own likeness and in his image. So when Satan came in and destroyed everything, it is the image of the father himself, which was brought into Jeopardy. And so he has to give out his image once again, the second time. So through the son, he gives it. And through the son, it goes back. When you read Desire of Ages, page 21, paragraph 2. And so... The circuit of beneficence is the father is the source of everything through the son. And then we, when it comes to us, we are the branches and then we bear the fruit. This fruit is the fruit of what? The fruit of the spirit. And the spirit, the owner is the father. And so it comes from the father unto us and trickles the same. So the righteousness, because the fruit of the spirit is kindness, love, temperance, is it? These are divine attributes, is it? This is character. And so this is the character of the Father flowing to the Son to us. And so we cannot say by our righteousness. No. It is the righteousness of Jesus Christ, is it? Because the Father has given him the Spirit and he gives us the Spirit. 
And then we produce the character that really is the character of the father. And so Christ says that uh, I am the way, the truth and life. No one comes to the father, but by me. So now he stands in between and then the righteousness is accorded to him. So that is the circuit of beneficence. At the end of the day, what you'll be having is the character of the father. Because it comes from the husbandman to the vine, to the branches. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because the relationship was seared, is it? It was broken. The relationship between who? The father and the creature. Is it? Yeah. Isaiah 59, it is because of your sins that you have been separated from the father, is it? So the plan of redemption is to get us back to the father. Yeah, to get us back to the one who was offended. Yeah, to this connection. So the ultimate connection is the connection to the Father. And it has to go through Christ. Because man could not do anything. So Christ had, uh, God had to offer his only son. So that at the end of the day, we get connected back to him. Mm. Uh, yes. Uh. Mm. Mm -hmm. that is it amen amen and so you you read uh you know that uh powerful quote in da 21 point two all things christ received from god but he took to do what to give so in the heavenly course in his ministry for all created beings through the beloved son the father's life flows what is that life the spirit is it according to john 6 63 it is the spirit that quickeneth the flesh profited nothing the words that i speak unto their spirit and life and when the spirit is given out it comes with the character until we are all come to the fullness of the mature person and so through the beloved son, the father's life flows out to all through the son. It returns in praise and joyous service, a tide of love to the great source of all. And love, in fact, whoever loves keeps all the commandments. Is it? Yeah. According to the book of Romans, whoever loves keeps all the commandments. Love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as you love yourself. So the whole commandments are encompassed in the word love. And so when we receive the spirit, we receive this um, uh, love of uh, Christ. And so oh, okay. And uh, it says, uh, and thus through Christ, the circuit of beneficence is complete, representing the character of the great giver, the law of life. Yeah, praise the Lord. This is good news. Christ, our righteousness, justification, this is how it is such a good news to us look at ephesians chapter 4 the book of ephesians uh, ephesians chapter 4 in a moment i give you the verse start from verse um, verse 10 we are going until um, verse 13, 10 to 13, Ray. Of 
So until he feels all things, and in feeling all these things, it is until we come to the unity of faith unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So in giving out his spirit in the plan of redemption, the main work is that we may become perfect unto the measure and stage of the fullness of Christ. What is the state of Jesus Christ? What was his state and what is his state? A sinless being. Holy. Without blemish. Is it? Yeah. This is the stature. And uh, you know what Christ tells the disciples? Uh, it was, um, who had asked him? Is it Philip? Show us the father. Is it? In John chapter 14, is it? Yeah, and he says, Philip, you have been with me for this long and you are asking me, show us the father. Whoever has seen me has seen who? Why is Christ saying that? Is Christ the father? No, Christ is not the father, but how does he say that whoever has seen me has seen the father? Yeah, an embodiment of the father himself. In fact, we are told that uh, the only photograph that we have, the only true photograph that we have of God is uh, the son. Uh, let me find this. Uh, I'll try to give you this reference. I'll try to find it. I found this uh, reference so good. I always refer to it. Hebrews, uh, Hebrews chapter one verse three. Somebody to read Hebrews chapter one verse three. When we are just talking about the, the the status of the son and how we can reflect that. One three. Yes. So Ephesians saying until we come to the fullness of the stage of man, Jesus Christ, is it? Now, and I was talking about Philip asking Jesus Christ, show us the father. And Christ says that if you have seen me, you have seen the father. In which way I'm the representative character of my father. Look at um, how it is explained in 7 BC, 906 paragraph 3. We are talking about the good news of justification. 7 BC 906.3, it says, we have only one perfect photograph of God and this is Jesus Christ. Yeah. And so when we have Christ, actually we are accepted in the son because we have come to that perfection that Christ, the God name. Matthew 5.48, be perfect. As your father in heaven is perfect. And how do we become that perfect? By having the son in us. By having the son in us. And so I'd like to just put forward the last sentiment. The scripture declares that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God as we understand 3.23 of Romans. We are carnal and sold under sin. Romans chapter 7, verse 14. And there is none, not one, who doeth righteousness in the flesh. That is Romans 3, 10. In the flesh dwelleth no good thing. And we are filled with unrighteousness. And so there is no in us any inherent of righteousness that we can present before heaven is no, nothing in us that can commend us in heaven. Only then in Christ are we made acceptable. Only in Christ. Yes. Uh, we are told in Psalms 119, 
read Psalms 119, 172. And then uh, I'll read something in uh, the spirit of Prophets 1888 material. Psalms 119, 172, talking about that in us there dwelleth nothing good. All have seen and fall short glory of God. And in us dwelleth no good thing. 119.172. All thy commands are what? Righteousness or righteous. But can any man say that really by thought and by action they have obeyed the law of God? Is there a man that can boast that I have really obeyed the law of God to its fullness by thought and by action. Can you name such a one man? Only Jesus, only Jesus. And so in us, when we talk about inherent righteousness, clean, pure thought, for you, you, you remember the Bible says that let this mind that was in Christ be in you, is it? Yeah, it is the only man that is referred to that let this mind be in you because he fulfilled the law of righteousness, both by thought and by action. But man has been prone to sin. Man has this weakness and tendency to sin. And so only Christ. And uh, talking about we, uh, we have all sinned and fallen short of glory of God. Think about this. When Adam sinned, what was taken away? What happened? He lost what? He lost glory, is it? Mm -hmm. Do we need that glory again? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are children born with that glory? Are children born with the glory that Adam had before he sinned? <laughs> <laughs> You don't know, look at uh, the child, the hammer. Is she having the glory that Adam had before sin? No, that child is not having that glory. And so that child needs glory. Is it? Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, is it? Yeah. By the way, we shall deal with that text. David says that this glory, people are not having it. And so the children are born needing a savior, needing that glory, 51 verse 4. We need that. So we have lost. The consequence of sin did take away the glory. Is it? Yeah, and we need it back. Children are born without that glory, although they have not done anything good or bad. But still they need what? that glory because it was lost as a con even jesus christ himself was born without that glory he had the perfection of the divinity in, in himself and he was subject to the parents at the end but that glory you remember he tells the father glorify thou me with the glory that i have it is not just the internal but even the external glory that surrounded him when he was before the throne did he take the nature of God when he came down? When Christ came as a baby, did he take the nature of God? He took the nature of a servant, is it? He emptied himself, according to Philippians chapter 2. And so in Christ only, the one who has gotten back the glory is our hopes, not in anyone else. 1888 material, page 816, paragraph 1. I think I have some two things to read and then we can pray. 816, paragraph one, 1888 materials, page 816, paragraph one, talking about there is no righteousness in man that can be offered before heaven. We are told like this, I ask, how can I present this matter as it is? The Lord Jesus imparts all the powers can, and I ask this, can man in his fallen nature initiate any process of redemption? 
can he initiate the steps back to being in favor with God? I'll repeat, maybe in a, a simpler language. Man, can he initiate any steps back to Christ? Hey. Hey. Man runs away. Yeah. Man only in shed filth. He runs. Can you listen? When somebody robs a bank, does he go back to the police? I robbed a bank. Now I have come to clear myself. He runs, is it? Until maybe he, he, he reaches at a point and maybe the news are going on and he hears, you know what? The president has said the people who robbed the bank have been pardoned. And they only need to appear before him. Then the man is so happy. At that point, he's happy that he can go back his pardon. But even at that point, can he go back? Still, he has some doubts, is it? This may be a plot to get me. So he starts looking for some assurances. But because he's so far away from the, the presence of the president, there is no way he can get assurance. He can just have that joy there. But Christ goes beyond that. The spirit speaks to the person. You know, you have been accepted in Christ. There is somebody. Until the man again, he's seated there and here, you know you have been pardoned because the money you stole, somebody has said that they are being returned by him. And now this man says, now if the money has been returned, now I can go and say, I'll not, I'll not go and rob again. So let me go to the president. The money has been returned. My initiative is to tell him, I'll not do it again. But even at that point, does, man, does that man have the power not to go to the bank? No, he still have that clamoring. He still have that appetite of going to rob. And so this is the scenario man have seen and is running away. And Christ asked Adam, where, where are you headed to? Huh? He says, you know, I'm not worthy to be near you. Hmm? I, I'm having already lives. How can I be in your presence, a glorious person? Christ tells him, no, you know what? I stepped in. There's nothing wrong for you being here. And then he's accepted. So he says, the Lord Jesus imparts all the powers. Man cannot initiate a step. So all righteousness comes from Jesus Christ. All the grace, all the penitence, all the inclinations, all the pardon of sins in presenting his righteousness for man to grasp by living faith, which is also the gift of God. Everything is a gift from point A to point Z. Listen to this. If you would gather together everything that is good and holy and noble and lovely in man and then present the subject to the angels of God, as acting part in the salvation of the human soul or in merit to the proposition will be rejected as treason. If you gather all the goodness, go take the goodness of Job, take the goodness of Daniel, Enoch, Abraham, and say, now because of this man's righteousness, they can get to heaven or I can get to heaven. The angels will tell you this is treason of highest order. Because the first person who sinned, actually, he ran away. Talking about Abraham, the father of faith, when he was told to go to Ur. No, he didn't go there. Genesis chapter 11 says that he stayed to some place. Is it? And then Romans says that again God appeared to him and told him, live and go to Mesopotamia. And then now he, he can live. So man cannot say that I have done anything that actually... I can present before God, even the father of faith himself. He can't, he can't appear before heaven and say, you told me to go to the south downward in Egypt, which was so filthy and I went. No, he cannot. It says, standing in the presence of their creator and looking upon the unsurpassed glory which enshrouds his person, they are looking upon the lamb of God given from the foundation of the world to a life of humiliation to be rejected of sinful men, to be despised, to be crucified. Who can measure the infinity of the sacrifice? Who can present his righteousness 
to be accepted before God. And so in us, there's nothing good, but in Christ we have the glad good news. This is what I want you to see and we pray. That uh, in Christ was found all righteousness that could satisfy the Father. And then the, that righteousness he confers to the subject of the kingdom. John chapter 1. Let us read John chapter 1, verses 12 downward. John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, as we pray. May the Lord help us to grasp the things we are talking about, the good news about justification, the good news of having Christ in us. John chapter 1, verses 12. But as many as received him, them them came out and found the time to fall, even to them that believed him. If the one was that not believed, not believed. Yes. This is the only thing that we can rejoice in. This is the only thing we can rejoice in. But as many as received him to them, gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of what? Of God. And how are we born like that? Christ tells Nicodemus, you must be born by water and by the spirit. That spirit of Christ is which we are born of, and then we become sons of God. And so justification is good news because in it, what Satan and Adam, uh, uh, Satan did to Adam and Eve is reversed in Jesus Christ. May the Lord be with us as we go through this week's presentation. And may he give us courage, courage to walk in the truth that we have, that strength, and whatever charge, you know, we are in the last generation and this last generation is the one that has to answer the puzzle that man can live a holy life and without guile in his mouth. This generation is the generation to see Jesus Christ coming in the clouds of the air. But how shall this generation be able to endure the brightness of his coming? It says that when he appear, we shall be like him, is it? Yeah, beloved. Now. It does not appear unto us what we shall be. First John 3 verse 2. But when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. So if he is appearing in glory and we see him as he is, then it means that we are clothed with that glory. His own glory makes us be able to see him as he is and stand in his presence. May the Lord be with us. We can pray in closing. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, you say that uh, your grace is sufficient and uh, in our weakness, the strength is made perfect. This is the good news that we have in Christ. We are victors. And so we pray that uh, you may teach us, you may admonish us. And Lord, we may Behold this sublime truth and reflect thy own image. We thank you, Lord. We need thy spirit every hour and every minute. And so shower on us in a new measure that, Lord, we may be able to endure the trials of this world and overcome every temptation. Bless your children and continue being with us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.